Okay, good morning and welcome uh, to the public part of the 23rd meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I ask people please to ensure that their mobile phones are on silent? Uh, no apologies have been received, so we'll move straight on to the agenda item two, which is the Transport Scotland Bill. This is our second evidence session on the Transport Scotland Bill, and the committee will take evidence from local authorities, regional transport partnerships, and their representatives. Uh, I'd like to welcome Gordon Mackay, Chair of the Society of Chief Officers of Transportation in Scotland. Sorry, that's quite a mouthful. Uh, Charlie Hoskins, Member Society of the Chief Officers of Transportation in Scotland. Almost got it right the second time. Uh, Jim Grieve, uh, Head of Programmes uh, for Sestran. Bill Kylo, Head of Policy and Planning, Strathclyde Partnership for Transport. Paul, Paul Lawrence, the Executive Director of Place City of Edinburgh. And uh, David Summers, the Principal Prompt passenger transport officer for the Highland Council. Welcome. Uh, we have a series of questions. For those of you that haven't given evidence before at the committee, uh, if I just say, if you want to ask, answer a question, if you try and catch my eye, I will bring you in. Uh, I'll try and do it in a balanced way. Please don't be offended if, if I can't bring you all in on every single question. We may well run out of time if I did. And you don't need to touch your microphone buttons in front of you. That will all be worked out and done for you. So the first question this morning comes from Colin. Colin. Th thanks, Kavina. Um, good morning to, to the panel. Um, I want to kick off um, on the issue of buses within the bill. Um, the, the draft bill or the bill that's before us um, currently re would restrict new local authority bus companies to run in only those non-profit making services that, frankly, commercial companies wouldn't touch. Do you think that restriction is fair, or do you think that local authority bus companies should be allow allowed to run all bus services? you would like to come in there. Um, Charlie, do you, do you start off with that, if you like? Yeah, good morning. Um, as well as uh, representing Scots, I've also got a senior director role in SPT, so perhaps can also help uh, answer that question uh, with, with uh, my colleague Bruce and Gordon. I think um, it is uh, our view that it's probably restrictive. Um, I think if you look at the moment how uh, we currently fund subsidised services, um, certainly within the west of Scotland, there's um, of the order of £11 million per annum. Um, that £11 million per annum is effectively tendered uh, to bus operators. Those are the same bus operators that are running the commercial services. So that's, that, that's the difficulty in terms of going back to the market in those areas. Um, so I think the challenge in terms of restricting it um, to socially necessary services is by their nature, um, they don't have um, major patronage um, in terms of the numbers uh, that use the services. Um, and ultimately, if those services become quite successful, you're then subject to a private operator obviously coming in and saying, well, that now looks pretty good, uh, let's run a service. And in order to even set up that, you have to invest in depots, uh, vehicles, uh, people, and all the processes, etc. So, so I think the view is that, um, certainly in the Scots' view as well, is that there's some big challenges there. And then it might be something that the committee wishes to look at in terms of broadening uh, the remit of that particular area in the bill in terms of municipally owned. Uh, David, sorry, I'm just looking around, so just catch my... Paul, do you want to come in as well? Uh, let David go first, yeah. and then I'll come back to you. OK. Um, to some extent, I'll be speaking personally here. Um, the council, Highland Council, has supported the um, power to have uh, bus companies, council-owned bus companies. Um, we are positive about that. Our members have not specifically considered as yet uh, the line in the bill that was uh, the subject of your question. Um, so on that one, I can only speak personally. Uh, I feel that for a directly operated council service, that restriction is probably appropriate. But if it was an arm's length company or a council owned company, then that should have the same uh, commercial freedom as any other company. Uh, and I feel that for any more than very modest scale, 
uh, as the council-owned company that is the, the way that I would support uh, going. Interestingly, the bill doesn't make any mention of that. It talks about council-operated bus services, but it doesn't mention companies, and uh, that's an area that I think could be clarified as the bill progresses. Okay, I'm going to bring in Bruce, and then I'm going to ask Stuart, I think it's got a supplementary before I bring in Paul. So, Bruce, would you mind going on that one now? Sure. Uh, just to amplify what, what Charlie was saying, I think in, we've been in discussions with Transport Scotland, we have been reassured there will be opportunities through regulation and secondary legislation to have a look at some of these kind of things. And I think the aspiration generally across Scotland, when people have looked at a, an organisation like Lothian Buses, I think they've seen that and they've, they've, they've aspired to that. I think it's really to do with the definition of what you call socially necessary. And obviously that will change across, across Scotland. The way that Charlie outlined there, the way that we approach it is we support, we subsidise bus services. Uh, we've spread that £11 million a year that we've got for supporting bus services ever thinner, uh, utilising community transport. Uh, demand responsive transport through our, our my bus service as well um, but people's definition of socially necessary in the highland area and in some of the more deprived areas of glasgow will will be different and i think that's an opportunity within the bill to perhaps widen uh, the consideration of how uh, a municipal company could operate uh, colin uh, i know stuart's wanting in if you want to follow up on that colin i, do, I, I just wonder um Two, two points, really. How we've ended up in a position where the government have brought forward such a restricted proposal in a bill when, frankly, the consensus seems to be that it is a restriction. Uh, and Scottish government officials did indicate when they gave evidence, Transport Scotland officials, when they gave evidence recently that they were in discussions now, effectively looking potentially to lift that restriction uh, going forward. Can I ask what discussions you've had with Transport Scotland officials on that particular issue? Has anybody actually been involved in those discussions and making the point about lifting that restriction? Paul, I don't want to cut you off, but I think this is more uh, uh, Bruce at this stage. So, Bruce, would you like to answer that? Yeah, sure. And one thing that we would say really from the outset, I think, in this bill is that Transport Scotland officials have been very good in terms of their level of engagement with uh, the Regional Transport Partnerships, SPT, uh, and I, I think the councils, that's most certainly been something that's positive. And uh, uh, looking back over the last six or seven years, it's something that we've been uh, promoting a change to the framework for bus uh, in, in Scotland um, through our bus policy uh, and through various other initiatives that we've had. So I think um, you know it's been partly our pushing that, that, that's led to this situation. I wouldn't want to speak, obviously, on behalf of Transport Scotland or the Scottish Government, why they've put this restriction into socially necessary. I'm aware, however, that you know there is obviously the, the competitive angle to this. Uh, and bus operators have the right, you know, and I'm making no judgment calling whether that's right or wrong. Uh, they run commercial services, and should a socially necessary service uh, go over the top of that, then they would have a, a big issue. So perhaps that kind of background to uh, where the Scottish Government are coming from in this. But we have been in dialogue with TS, uh, and, and the, you know, there has been dialogue about how this could be widened out, perhaps, as I said earlier, looking at that definition of what you know, social need and socially necessary is, and each area would have a, a, a particular view on that. Come back at that very briefly. Just, uh, just I'm, briefly. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit confused with that. That, that still is a restricted model for what you're suggesting. I mean, why can't we have the Lothian Buses model, where, frankly, a, a local authority-owned bus company can <coughs> run in competition to the private sector? Because there is no competition in the bus sector at the moment. Sure. I, and I think the, the, the thing with Lothian Buses, a fantastic bus company that they are, the history of that organisation and the history of how the bus market in each area of, the, of the Scotland has developed is, uh, is very different. Um, in, in Edinburgh and the Lothians, you've maybe got two or three operators. Uh, in the west of Scotland, where we are, we've round, got around about 60 operators. That's the way the market has developed, based on decisions that were made previously. Um, I think the aspiration, as I say, from uh, some of the councils and, and RTPs and others, uh, has been to look at the Lothian model and how that could be applied in their area. The elephant in the room, of course, being funding, and how you start off something like that with depots, pensions, vehicles. 
Um, but as I say, I think the, 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 the legislation, as it's proposed at the moment, uh, wouldn't allow the creation of a Lothian type model. But I know that TSR considering how that perhaps could be widened out to, uh, to, to appease those who are, who are anxious to do the, the Lothian style model. Paul, I'm happy to bring you in. Then I want to go to Mike Rumbles with, with a follow-on. So. Just um, very briefly, Convene, I suppose it's a, a good link from what Bruce was saying. Obviously, from an Edinburgh point of view, we do benefit from the Lothian model in the way that members um, uh, have discussed. And I suppose it was to emphasise that point, and uh, exactly right, different history, different circumstances, different market. But it does give us, as a local authority, an opportunity to have a strategic relationship with a provider, looking not only at social requirements, but also at the economic growth requirements of the city, and think about economic and social dimensions in the wider spatial planning as a whole. It allows that holistic relationship, which I'm not convinced the current provisions would allow elsewhere. OK, Mike. Um, we were told last week by the civil service bill team that um, this is going to give power to the 32 councils to run their own bus companies, if that's the wish, but it would only be on loss-making routes. We are interested in having effective legislation, so qu my question to you is this. How many of those 32 councils are likely to want to invest in all the human resources and the depots and the buses to create a loss and run, a loss making service. I'd like to know how many of those 32 councils would do something like that. So who wants to answer for the 32 councils across Scotland? Gordon. Um, clearly councils currently operate in a very difficult financial environment. Uh, and uh, I think the, the number of councils that would actually take the, the offer uh, that we currently have forward would be somewhere between nil and very low. Okay. Um, uh, David, just before you do, I'm going to bring Stuart in and then maybe we can tie it up. Um, I just wanted... One of the things that's put to me from time to time by constituents and others is that when a route becomes non-economic and a bus company wants to shut it down, the council steps in because it is socially necessary and that then same company in what may be a locally quasi-monopolistic situation comes back in and now gets paid to run the, the bus service. Um, how, how can we deal with that? Because although in individual circumstances you might be able to justify it, it doesn't sound awfully good. And I think there's plenty of opportunity for a bit of gaming there. Is that statement by me overplaying the situation? Is it something that you recognise? Charlie, you wanted to come in on that. Um, pretty much on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think that's a step before um, organisations like SPT and local authorities actually step in. And there's a lot of hidden work goes on behind the scenes to convince the operator it's not the right thing to do. Um, that there's a bigger picture that they should consider than, than purely one of profit. And to be fair to operators, they do have that consideration quite often. And they do really consider it to be a last resort that they have got to pull that service out. So, so our socially necessary um, guideline criteria that we use, then we work through that to say what type of service needs to be put in. Now, one of the difficulties, and I'm hoping the committee might come onto this, is the data that's required to do that. We do not get the data from the operators that actually uh, tells us how many passengers, their origin, their destination, etc. So one of the big things the bill's got to address is data and the requirements for that for whatever framework, whether it be a partnership or a franchise. Just briefly, are you allowed to see the data for the, uh, the, the concession card scheme? Uh, because I that would be one part of the answer. Yeah, I would have to defer and come back to the committee on that. I'm not 100% right. certain on, on that point. But, but just to follow on and, uh, and answer your point about what the dynamic then looks like, the dynamic for us is quite interesting because we then go into the procurement legislation. So, so we've, we've introduced a more dynamic purchasing method to, to, to make it a little bit more efficient. But ultimately, you're still going back to a market, and quite often in those areas, you've maybe got one or maybe a couple other operators. Uh, and that operator will take a view on what he believes is the right price for that because he's in a competitive tender situation. What also happens quite often, and our committee members see this when we bring it for approval, is that we will often go back out again because it's simply unaffordable, the returns that we get, and there's a lot of dialogue with operators about the affordability of that. So one of the opportunities there might well be, and the committee might come to, is in the partnership model. Not, not, not just in a franchise model, that there's some ability to share that data a bit more so that what you're paying as a cost is effectively a top-up cost 
rather than that you're buying a whole chunk of a service over here. So that's, that's a dynamic, obviously, that's quite interesting, but um, in terms of hopefully that gives the member a bit more insight. OK, I'm briefly going to bring in uh, the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross, and then I'm going to go to uh, Richard Lark. Gail. Um, my question is, thank you, Convener, and good morning. My question, um, David, is specifically for you. You won't be surprised to hear. Um, are there any school routes in Highland that are specifically just for schools that would be able to be opened up to the public when we're talking about social routes? Um, and if there are, what would what would need to be done to allow this to happen? And is that covered in the bill, or can that be done now? Okay. Uh, the, That's you on the spot on a non-constituency question from the <laughs> deputy convener. <laughs> no, that is, that is fine. Um, that uh, can be done at the moment. Um, and in fact, we've uh, increased over uh, the last uh, two or three years, we have increased the number of school routes that are open to the public. But working against that uh, has been the uh, public service vehicle accessibility requirements where it may need a coach, 50-seater coach, to take the number of school pupils, and that now doesn't uh, conform, if it hasn't got a wheelchair lift on it, doesn't conform to the accessibility requirements, and therefore these have had to be removed from the public network, uh, because the alternative would be two buses at higher cost. Uh, I think it's fair to say that's only happened where the public usage has been minimal in any case. Um, but the current legislation allows councils to run school buses. We do it with a few minibuses. We don't have any large buses, but we do have minibuses. And it also allows us to make off-peak use of uh, these vehicles for providing a public service. Um, that's pretty restricted because it does depend on it having its core use as a, as school transport. And uh, we would certainly welcome the provision in the bill that um, broadens that out. Uh, I think there are issues about operator license. I certainly would say that um, any operation like that should be uh, under an O license, which I think is the intention of uh, the bill, but isn't specifically stated. Uh, and uh, perhaps refer referring back to Mr. Rumble's uh, question about uh, loss making, the power uh, proposed is to run services which the private sector haven't. Uh, registered. Now, that may be loss-making for them, but not necessarily for us. And I'm thinking about a case in Murray, uh, where that happened recently, where uh, the private sector operator withdrew a route, and the council was able, using off-peak uh, time on a school bus, uh, to replace that service at what I understand is more or less break-even. Uh, so it's the fact that the consideration is not is it loss making or not it's is any other is any commercial provider providing it or not okay um, there are other people who want to come in but I, I, actually richard wants to drill down into a few questions there. so richard if you go next and i'll um, bring other people in afterwards thank you Kandina. i know that um uh, mr Cullo, uh, bruce Cullo, had touched on several of the questions i was going to ask so i'll wrap my questions up to a wee bit simpler and but basically in Scotland, let me set the scene. We're spending millions of pounds in bus transport. In my area, there are numerous bus operators set up by uh, people who really don't provide a service in some areas and are letting, basically, I would suggest, my constituents down. So, you know, and the Scottish Government officials, who I believe could be bolder, uh, gave evidence to a committee last week indicating there may be state, state aid, competition rules, preventing local authority bus companies <laughs> providing a commercial service. Should we not be trying to reintroduce, you know, come back, the Glasgow Corporation, all is forgiven. Uh, shouldn't we not be trying to reintroduce a public bus service that serves the public in Scotland? Uh, and does this transport bill fail? on that regard. Um, I think, Bruce, that's you. Yep, thanks, thanks for your question. I think it's, it's an interesting point that the, the West of Scotland bus market, just to put it into perspective, 60 million passengers down over the last 10 years, uh, facing a lot of difficulties. I mentioned there are around about 50 to 60 operators that, that are in our area at the moment. Five, six years ago, that was 120. 
Now, some of those have been bought over, but some of those have gone out of business. I think it's we are proud of what we do at SPT in providing that public service and subsidising those services, which are deemed socially necessary. But that, I suppose a wider question would be, should you be relying on a piece of legislation to try and turn a bus market which is in decline uh, down? Possibly not. Um, will this new bill make the world a better place as far as bus in the west of Scotland goes? Hopefully, probably. I think it's better. The, the proposals for bus service improvement partnerships are better than what's in there from the statutory quality partnerships previously. I think the proposal is in relation to franchise and a whole range of questions around that uh, is better than quality contracts. And one thing's for sure that whatever state this legislation comes out in, we'll explore every opportunity to try and maximise uh, the, the, the benefits of the new legislation for the people of the West of Scotland. But again, it comes down to, and, you know, as I say, the elephant in the room is really the funding aspect of it. We, we spoke earlier on about our £11 million uh, budget for support and socially necessary services. That generally, as a rule, works out uh, around about £5 per head per person uh, for, for a year for uh, our area. You go down south, um, you're looking at perhaps £25 a head for some of the, the bigger regions. Uh, £15 a head for some of the others. You go to London and it's around about £100 a head. These are very rough figures. Um, and you do get what you pay for. Um, so whatever the new legislation comes forward with, if there's money there to back it up, that will make life a bit easier. And definitely, if we're going into negotiations with the operators for a bus service improvement partnership, whatever form it may take, um, they always sit up and take notice if you're bringing a bit of money to the table. Correct me if I'm wrong. I could go and set up a bus service tomorrow if I got all the necessary licences, da 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 da. Right? We have a crazy situation. I'm in Motherwell. We have a crazy situation that two buses follow each other going the same route because they're different companies. Crazy. We're paying that money out for nothing. So why don't we sit down and decide here's what we need, here's what we want, and here's what's going to serve my and your passengers and my constituents. We're not doing that. And this bill won't do anything to resolve that. Or will it? Tell me. Briefly, well, Charlie, do you want to have a go at that? Yeah, because it's actually fallen up on the, on the, on the point that Bruce is making. And, uh, and you're absolutely right. For somebody who also lives locally in the area, I very much see that um, as a passenger as well. Um, I think there's a couple of areas in the bill that there is that opportunity to do that. Um, at the moment, we try and do that with operators through the registration process. So their registrations come in, and when they actually come to us, we try and suggest to them that actually that's not a good registration because it's, it, it's, it's too aggressive against another operator. It should be spread. So, you know, if somebody's coming in on the clock, there shouldn't be somebody five minutes later. It should be 15 to try and give a 15-minute service, as an example. I think something like the Bus Services Improvement Partnership is a good idea in that regard because that's actually the whole point to sit down and plan that network. Now, one of the things that we need to have to do that is the data. I apologise if that's the second time I've said it, um, but it's really, really important. And, and we've said in our submission, um, certainly in the SPT submission, and, and, and Scots has made the point as well, that we actually need to get to the heart of that data. That data gives you the network to plan, and then from that, you wouldn't necessarily, you would hope not to be setting up a partnership that you would then experience that type of situation. Thank you, Charlie. Maureen, you've, you want to follow in? Convener, uh, good morning, uh, gentlemen. Um, Many of you will have community uh, buses running in your area. Indeed, this committee in a previous incarnation uh, did an inquiry into community transport. What effect, if any, would this, uh, pr the proposals in this bill have on community transport groups? Um, Bruce, followed by Charlie. Just um, really to say community transport, we view it as a, as a key part of the, the transport mix nowadays. It's an essential part of our provision for the transport network in the west of Scotland. Some of the, the issues that we've talked about earlier on for these socially necessary services, if our funding uh, can only go so far, we are uh, very supportive and relying on community transport to assist us in filling that gap. And we've put our money where our mouth is in that regard in supporting uh, some fantastic community transport uh, organisations around the west of Scotland, an essential part of it. And I would see that through things like the Bus Service Improvement Partnership, 
um, they would be a key part of that mix. I think um, it would be folly for us to ignore that. And uh, we want to build on the success we had the West of Scotland Community Transport Network which was trying to set a standard for community transport uh, in the west of Scotland, and we're delighted to have operators sign up to that, enabling them to be able to access funding for us. So we will work with the community transport organisations through the provisions of this, this Act, if it, if it comes to that, and uh, make the best of the, the situation that we have. As an alternative to local authorities, um, expanding that be an alternative to local authorities setting up um, their own bus companies. And David, I don't know if you want to come in because you've got some in the Highlands. Uh, yes, I'm happy to come in with that. Um, I think you know, the community transport position is a little uncertain while Westminster are still reviewing the position of Section 19 and Section 22. Uh, permits, although the indications uh, that we're getting from them are they're um, backpedalling a bit from their original um, very restrictive uh, interpretation. Uh, community transport is likewise, as Bruce has said, very important in our area too. There's 25 groups that we currently support. Uh, they're mostly pretty small scale, and I don't see much impact from this bill on them. Uh, because they're not operate, operating under uh, PSV O licences. Now, if any groups wanted to expand uh, the level where taking on an O licence was appropriate, then the provisions that are here for partnerships and so on would apply just as they do with the commercial sector, uh, and that uh, could be positive. But overall, I think this bill is addressing a different market from uh, what community transport, at least in our area, uh, provides complementary, not competing. Could community transport operators do it as a substitute for uh, council operation? Under the permit system, it's restricted to what the permit provides for, um, but there is, there's a potential to explore there. I don't think I can go further than that at the moment. Maureen, I'd like to bring in Jim, because he, he, he hasn't had a chance yet, and then I'd like to go back to Richard, if that's all right. So, Jim. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Just to give a voice to the south east of Scotland, uh, as well as the west and, and the north. Community transport is something that we're certainly very interested in from the regional transport uh, partnership perspective, particularly for, for uh, rural areas such as Scottish borders, where there are some real issues with um, the numbers of bus services that are available to people there. So I'm, I'm not sure to what extent this bill will assist in, in, in that sort of development, but it's certainly something we're very keen to do. And again, to refer to the elephant in the room that Bruce has raised a number of times, if there was more funding available, and that's something that we would certainly like to make some progress with. OK. Um, Richard, you had a... a uh, uh, last question, and thank you, Mr Greve, for... Um, I, certainly, I certainly agree with you. Um, Scottish Government officials indicated last week that the proposed local service franchise regime would remove the entry bar, which has prevented any authority from pursuing a, a bus quality contract. Is this your view? Do you share that view? And if so, how many local service franchises could we possibly expect to see operating within the next few years? Uh, if uh, any. As I cut you off. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, this is something new. Um, I think we are of the view that it certainly removes that previous bar, which in effect in a quality contract was about proving a negative. It was about proving that there was market failure. However, what's in place of that are some really stiff challenges in terms of setting up a franchise. The analysis that's required, I'm sorry for the third time to say about data, but the data you required to do that analysis, but to, to, to give you some comparator, um, uh, Transport for Greater Manchester um, are investing £11 million on the analysis of a franchise, not the delivery of it, the analysis of a franchise. So that's, that's the same budget that we have for the delivery of services in the Strathclyde area, which is roughly the same uh, conurbation size as, as Greater Manchester. So I think there's a lot of challenges in that. I think you know, we, we in kind of Scots share the same view in terms of um, you know, some of the checks that are in there with an independent panel. Um, all of that work to get to a point that could quite easily just not take place, despite the Transport Authority believing it's the right thing to do. So I think there's some, 
really stiff challenges in that and we'll be interested in seeing what that kind of guidance looks like with the mechanics of, of, of how you do that. So whilst well, I might have removed a bar, I think there's a few other <laughs> big chunky obstacles uh, for us to overcome to get to that point. Whether it means you've got certain areas, um, and there was a certain area that we had, um, and it was in Lanarkshire, uh, a number of years ago that we did considerable analysis on a quality contract, but we couldn't quite get over that bar. Um, whether that is an area that we might explore as a franchise in the future, uh, it's probably that kind of size that we're looking at where we're seeing there's um, some maybe unmet need, but again, it's difficult to get the data to actually underpin that. Okay. Uh, thank you. I think we'll mo move this on just slightly. And John Finney, would you like to to go with your yeah, questions. Yeah, thank you, um, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, I have a number of questions regarding smart and integrated ticketing, and I think we'd all welcome the extension to include rail and ferry services. <coughs> Excuse me, there's a, several proposals in there, and uh, a lot of them relate to powers given to ministers about uh, technical standards, definitions, um, the establishment of a, an advisory board. Now, we've had a couple of representations from local authorities. I've read you what... Um, Eastern Bartonshire Council um, say they raise concerns that proposals, and I quote here, may generate a large number of individual smart cars that cannot be used across transport, uh, across um, a number of travel platforms. And uh, Stirling tell us they consider the system would be much more useful and understandable customers if it were compulsory for operators to join such schemes. Uh, are you able to comment on what you see as the, the benefits of any of the proposals in the bill about smart ticketing, please? Um, Charlie, I, I noticed you, you wanted to come in. I'm, I'm sure other people have views on it. But let's start with you, Charlie, and then we'll perhaps bring other people in. Yes, yes. So, sorry, apologies for slight kind of dominating it, but quite a lot of deep experience in this particular area of uh, uh, integrated ticketing and smart ticketing. I think there's two things, first of all. I think if there's a technical standard, um, and members might be aware that there's a technical standard, which is ITSO, which is the technical standard. So the technical platform to interop, interoperate between operators is there. And that's a UK-wide technical standard. Um, uh, within the subway, we've had that for five years. We interoperate with ScotRail and we interoperate with a number of bus operators. But the difficulty is striking the commercial and operational agreements with those operators for a couple of different reasons. One, as soon as you start integrating products, there's a fear that you're diluting your revenue as an operator. Because if you're sharing the journey and you're sharing the revenue, then potentially, as an operator in your own little space, you're, you're not getting the full fare from that. So that's an operator perspective that, that, that's well understood. Um, we operate own card and SPT area, a paper-based system. Um, so I think the technical platform is where you start from. I think the other interesting thing, uh, and we are trialling this at the moment, is that everybody talks about smart cards. Well, actually, the, the vast majority of what's grown up as a generation are actually on devices, smartphones and watches, etc. In fact, what you're wanting is a frictionless system where you're actually buying your ticket, um, it's downloaded to your phone and you're using that to either tap to go through the gate for a QR code, etc. So that whole space of technology, I think it would be wrong to start legislating at this moment in time and let that grow. And I think how it's written in the bill is actually pretty good because I think it needs an advisory group to ministers where the, all the operators are coming together to actually bring that forward and allow the technologies to develop into those spaces. Because I think the top down with so many operators of different uh, commercial views would be pretty near impossible without full regulation. And, and can I clarify, and this is at a stage where we're going about with two cards at the moment, because we're changing over uh, as parliamentarians here, is it sufficiently future-proofed with this advisory board? Because technology changes very rapidly and it would be, you know, we don't want a situation where something's imposed and uh, only to find the following week there's a another version. Ine yeah. Inevitably, there will be another version the following week. Of yeah, it's a good point. And actually, again, uh, Transport Scotland officials have been, I've, I've got to say, really open and pretty good on this, because we've, we've been talking to them about our experience as a number of operators had. And I think that's why you would have an advisory board. Don't impose something yet. You know, there's, a, there's quite a lot going on in that whole space of devices. So as long as you've got your technical standard, so you've got the security of the product on the card or the device, that's your core, and let the commercial and the operators come forward with what's the best medium. So is it a card, is it a phone, is it a watch, etc. And all of that's happening at the moment. And I have to say, Scotland's leading the way in a lot of this. So both in terms of the ScotRail network and what we're doing in the subway network, we're doing that right now. We've got customers tapping on the gates with their phone and actually going through with their phone, which is incredible. 
John, I'd like to bring in David, um, and, and I'm sure Stuart's going to flash his full cards in a minute, but... Uh, da da <laughs> to answer the supplementary I have to at okay. the same time then please and that was was there any concerns about the proposal to allow Scottish ministers to direct local authorities to establish smart ticketing David if you could comment on that please. that's actually the exact point that I wanted to make um, uh, I agree with everything that Charlie has said I just had two uh, supplementary points one was uh, that Transport Scotland have been very helpful and very positive in uh, helping to um, broaden the availability of smart enabled ticket machines. Um, the ones for our small operators in our area have been upgraded. Uh, they can do that. So that all helps. But the other thing was the provision in the bill that ministers can instruct the local authorities to introduce a smart ticketing scheme, but there's no power for local authorities to instruct operators to participate. So the ministerial instruction gets stuck halfway, if you like. Uh, and I think that's something that needs to be addressed. Charlie rightly outlined the commercial concerns, um, whether operators are going to lose revenue through it. But if that instruction is going to be effective, it needs to be able to follow through. Um, Jamie, do you want to come in? Uh, uh, John, I'll come back to you if there's anything further. Jamie, do you want to? Thank, thank you, convener, and good, good morning, panel. Um, I think one of the concerns really though is that what we may end up with is a situation where there are uh, a number of authorities who operate a system, a payment system that operates across multiple modes of transport. So you may have differentiation travelling from one local authority or, or region to another. Uh, there also will be different technologies in use by different operators who are uh, trying to increase patronage in their own mode of transport, and that's all fine. There are also national schemes layered on top of that uh, uh, as well. And isn't this all creating a very fragmented, quite confusing uh, payment landscape? Now, contactless clearly is a standard which can operate across all modes, but all that is doing is simply enabling payment uh, through the use of technology. It's not necessarily a payment or standardised platform itself in terms of ticketing. Government here has an opportunity and has done in other countries, such as in the Netherlands, where they introduced the chip cart uh, and, and other countries have done similar schemes. Government has an opportunity here to create a nationwide standard, nation, uh, national technology standards, but also uh, to ensure that all operators are uh, part of those schemes. Do you think this bill goes far enough to take away that confused, confused landscape and create a national scheme that, that works right across Scotland and across multiple travel modes? Um, I'm, I'm scanning everywhere. Char Charlie is always very keen to come in, so I'm very happy to bring him in. But if anyone else would like to chip in, Bruce, I'll bring you in afterwards. So, Charlie. Only because it's a very pertinent question that's happening uh, out there at this moment in time. And I guess what's quite clear in other countries is that quite often in those countries they've, they, they've got fully regulated transport systems as a whole. Because when you start imposing uh, things like um, a single payment mechanism, etc. You're getting into setting fair levels and all of those competition issues, which is really quite tricky to unpick all of that. Um, I, I suppose rather than it being fragmented, the question is, are we making it easy for the, easier for the customers? And I think that's where we try and focus. If we're making it easier for the customers for the types of journeys they make, I don't think you'll ever cover every single journey somebody makes in Scotland. So if you're making it for their normal trips, then you're making that easier. I, I think a time will come where there'll be another phase of technology and, and members will have heard of the mobility as a service as a concept where I think that whole space of how you aggregate uh, a, a transport planning system with a payment system and perhaps a big technology provider might actually supply that and operators feed into that. It, it's definitely a really interesting concept and I know the Scottish Government have, uh, have actually put some funding to that for the year ahead which is really good to see and there's some work that we're doing on that. So I think all of that's still emerging and I think our view is it would kind of be wrong to start imposing that just at this moment in time. I think there might be another chapter where that might be the right time to do that. Bruce, before I bring you in, uh, I'm going to let Stuart come in with his question and uh, then I'll bring you in, Bruce. Um, the, the, the first part is, are you planning in uh, uh, having a, a smart card to improve the security? I've got two here. I've just Suppose I found them in the street. I've just downloaded the XML data of both these cards. I now know the birthday 
and full name of the individual who holds these cards, notwithstanding the fact it's not printed on the outside of the card. In other words, there is no security whatsoever in preventing me in accessing the data on these ITSO cards. Um, uh, the other we question is, uh, ITSO cards currently are 4K and 16K. Is there enough space on the card to support the number of applications that uh, we might require? So that's two questions that are kind of techy. So, Bruce, I'll let you uh, answer the, the previous question and that one at the same time. I'm grateful for that, convener. <laughs> uh, Charlie will be able to, to come in and do the technical stuff. Uh, uh, just the point I wanted to, to make, I think it's, it's important to remember, you know, the... the the, our card that we've got in, in, um, in the west of Scotland that we've uh, developed over the last few years, people used to ask us, why did it take you so long to get a, a smart card up and running for a subway, which has only got 15 stations? And as Charlie outlined earlier, it wasn't that. The technical aspects of it weren't a problem. It was getting the business rules right, rightly or wrongly, making no judgment on it whatsoever. We have got 50 bus operators, we've got a rail company, we've got ferry companies, we've got us, we've got various others, and that's the market in which we, the, that we're operating. And, you know, over the last five years, we've gone out there and tried to get the operators on board, and we've been very successful in that. Now, I think we've got the most commercially successful transport smart card in, in Scotland, with over 170,000 cards out there, over £20 million worth of transactions. Just coming on to, 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 to Stuart's point, the, the security of the data, I think, is, is, is absolutely key to any kind of uh, trust that the customer has with you. I think that's essential in anything that can be done through this advisory board or whatever, through the, uh, the new Act, is, is, is essential. And just coming back to a point that, that David made, as far as we're aware, the, this, the way that it will work with this advisory board for smart card is that when the minister has a, a particular view or is looking for advice on something, he'll seek counsel from this advisory board. And it won't be a case of directing a local authority or an RTP or, or whoever it may be to bring in a scheme or bring in an arrangement. It'll be directing them towards the legislation that's available to them. That's as far as we're aware, which is a much different thing to directing an authority to actually do something. The legislation is there within the 2001 Transport Act about a, a setting up a ticketing arrangement or scheme. An arrangement is where the operators have got together and got a scheme, uh, got a, a ticketing system together, and a scheme is where the public authority come in and bring one in in the absence of an arrangement. So that, that is available and that, I, I think, will be continuing through uh, the new legislation and the, the, the powers of this advisory board. Paul, I can bring you in briefly before we move to really briefly, the next question. Um, I, I, what my colleagues have said, I support. Just, just a brief perspective from the tourist point of view. We've talked from residents and we've talked from your constituents and customers, but of course tourists and tourism is a huge industry for the country, um, don't necessarily have the same access um, in the way that residents do, and therefore the point of simply being able to use contactless in the way that we all can if we go to London tomorrow is very important for certain parts of the economy. So just thinking it from different economic and residents' points of view, I think is something the committee might want to bear in mind. Paul, that's very helpful. Thank you for that. Um, the next question is from Peter. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning, gentlemen. I'm going to move on to the, the uh, one of the big parts of the bill is low emission zones. And I think the first question really is, is very fundamental and to, to all the members of the committee, and it's a yes-no answer, really. Do you support the principle of establishing LEZs in Scotland? That's the first basic, and it's just a quick... Uh, OK, so, um, Gordon. Yes, provided they're fully funded. OK. Charlie. Uh, absolutely, and I agree with my colleague on that as well. <laughs> Jim. Yes, um, provided that all the carrots don't go into one one uh, council area and all the sticks go into adjacent council area. <laughs> Bruce. Yes, and uh, provided that the it's not just about you know emissions from vehicles, it's also about complementary measures delivered by councils and RTPs and other partners in terms of traffic management, bus priority as well, and funding, as Gordon said. Paul. Uh, yes, as, as, as long as it's part of a wider approach to placemaking in an area, not purely just a transportation and emissions issue. And David. Yes, I agree with uh, all of that uh, as well, that uh, low emission zones are uh, reduced emissions can be achieved in various ways, bus priority being one of them. And um, 
buses, I think, it should be seen as part of the solution, uh, not as part of the problem, but definitely yes. So okay. the answer is yes, Barton, your next question. That's all very positive, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased, pleased to hear that, but we, we do know that the funding is, a, is, a, is an issue, and that was, was going to be one of my questions, but you've already answered that one. The, the bill allows, gives the ability of local authorities to devise schemes appropriate to their circumstances. The problem with that, of course, is that you might get different schemes in different areas and confusion for travellers. Do you uh, think that the, the proposals in the bill strike the right balance between consistency, consistency across Scotland and the ability for local uh, authorities to, to, to design a scheme suitable for themselves? Gordon. Uh, yes, uh, Scott is content with the proposals. We do think uh, one size does not fit all, uh, and we are content with the flexibility that is provided for local authorities to find appropriate local solutions to their local issues. Okay. Jim, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, I guess just to illustrate what I said earlier about carrots and sticks. Um, if a city introduces a scheme and it's within the control of the city, um, the carrots are cleaner air, um, less congestion, more reliable bus trips and funding coming into that authority to, to improve all of these things. Whereas neighbouring authorities that uh, will have constitu constituents and, and commuters coming from these authorities into that city, um, sing single oc occupancy cars in particular, um, these people will have to look for alternative means of getting to the city, be it an upgraded car or better bus services or or active travel, whatever it may be. I think it's important that that wider perspective, that kind of regional perspective is taken into account so that uh, the benefits of an LEZ are, are equitable. David, would you have a view from, from the Highlands on that? Yes, uh, I think uh, we're in a different position from the urban authorities in, in not having these uh, council boundaries close to the, the conurbation. Uh, the, we do have an air quality management area in the centre of Inverness, so it is an issue uh, for us. But the, the bill um, requires uh, the objectives of a low emission zone to be set out. And I think that's good that that goes beyond just, strictly speaking, reducing emissions. So I mentioned um, bus priorities before, uh, traffic reduction, modal shift. Funding, as other members of the panel have said, is clearly an issue. We uh, traditionally in Highland have uh, put money into supporting rural bus services uh, where they're not economic. We have not really put money into bus uh, services to encourage people out their cars in the more uh, um, populated areas. I think that's something that might be um, a side effect, a beneficial one of this, again, subject to funding. You've all said that you, you welcome the ability to have different schemes, but nobody's really addressed the issue. That, do you not feel that this is going to create confusion among the general public? You might have a vehicle that's legal to drive into Edinburgh, but it isn't legal to drive into Glasgow, and I can see that creating big problems for, for drivers, at least in the initial phases. Um, you, don't, you don't accept that view? Um, Jim, do you want to come in, and then I'll let Charlie come in, and then I'd like to take a supplementary from John Finney. So, Jim. Sure, just briefly. I mean, I think in, in particular, the, the, uh, in terms of what vehicles are allowed into a low emission zone, my view is that that should be a, national, a nationally agreed set of criteria, so that you avoid the issue that you've just described, where you can mm -hmm. access one city with okay. a certain vehicle, but, but not another. Okay. Okay. Um, from a Scots perspective, we think what's proposed is reasonable. Uh, we do think it's important that the, the rules prevailing to a particular LEZ uh, are obviously clearly explained, and that would have to be via signage. John, do you want to come in with a supplement? Yeah, thank you, Kavina. It's, it's a question for David, and you, you talked about uh, an air quality management zone in Inverness, if I can be parochial, but it does have wider application too. I wonder if the, the, uh, there's a feeling for those areas who are not likely to be involved in the initial schemes that this legislation, if you like, provides some comfort that they won't act on issues. Um, because, you know, someone who's been affected by this, and we know that uh, air quality is a significant colour, um, um, they're not going to be bothered about legislation. If a local authority hasn't staken, taken steps to protect its citizens, they'll quite legitimately sue. I wonder, 
if you have concerns about that, particularly say in relation to Inverness, where um, the local authority was positively encouraging people to drive in the, the city centre in this particular air quality zone. <laughs> that's uh, that, that's a nice one to be put on the spot with. Um, I think. Authority about that particular one. So uh, I will. Okay. Uh, I have to admit I haven't seen that myself because it maybe hasn't come the the passenger transport uh, direction uh, in that. But um, I, I'd I'd like to perhaps to link that with um, the bus partnerships. Um, if we are addressing uh, air quality through partnership arrangements, uh, whether that's bus priority, uh, vehicle types. We do have a number of um, electric buses in Inverness, for example. Um, and I was dubious of some of the modelling that was uh, done of um, pollution, vehicle pollution because it was based on average bus fleets rather than taking account of the electric vehicles that Stagecoach have with us. Um, so looking at it and around taking in other aspects uh, of the bill, I think there's an opportunity to look at the, the whole thing in a more strategic uh, way. But uh, as for your uh, uh, direct question, I think you know, liability if, uh, uh, if a scheme isn't introduced, I, I think I'd have to pass on that one. OK, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Peter, you've got a follow-up question. Yeah, well, I would I'd just uh, drill down a bit more. Much of the detail relating to LEZs is to be set out in regulations currently under development uh, by the Scottish Government, and we asked some questions about that of them last week. But I just wonder what input have you guys had in, in the, you know, getting the detail of, of what an LEZ looks like uh, into, into, uh, into this bill? Bruce. Thanks, uh, Chair. Um, we've had a meeting, I think, last week with the, the relevant civil servants from TS about how a low emission zone would work in practice. And I came, I, again, I reiterated to them uh, the point I made earlier on in, in supporting LEZs. A real key factor is in this, um, and Glasgow City Council have acknowledged this. I think in uh, a report that they had done was that complementary measures are essential. I think it is important that we take, if we're looking at a, a measure such as a low emission zone, um, that we take a holistic view, an integrated view. We understand that this is going to have wider implications across uh, the, the network, the transport offer that's there for the, the, the travelling public. Uh, we need to get that done in a, in a manner which is uh, a coordinated way. So we'll look at bus priority measures, traffic management measures, uh, the public transport offer that's out there to encourage people to, to travel more sustainably. So um, they listen very you know, uh, well to me, um, and I think they're more than aware that this is something that the, they will have to deal with very carefully and in an in, a in the round type way. So uh, I think we're reassured that um, from what we've seen, um, that as, as this goes through, uh, becomes legislation, that the guidance and the regulations will be hugely important. And I think the, the key point for us is that um, when those uh, uh, ancillary measures that we're talking about as part of a low emission zone, there has to be some measure, way of within the LEZ documentation of ensuring commitment from partners to deliver. Who wants to come in? Yeah, just to, uh, expand on what Bruce said, and specifically in relation to the Glasgow LEZ, which is obviously the, the first of these to progress. Uh, I, I certainly am aware that our colleagues in Glasgow have been working closely. Uh, with Transport Scotland officials in terms of fleshing out the detail of that uh, and the experience of that is now beginning to flow through into the legislation. So I can assure you there is good dialogue in these kind of topics. Um, Paul, you were looking as if you didn't want to answer, but I wondered if you did actually on that. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, uh, uh, I think we've not had as much dialogue with Transport Scotland officials as we might have liked. That's perhaps not their fault. It's maybe ours as much. So maybe it sounds like the dialogue in the East is not as advanced as it is um, in the West. Um, I, I think Jim's point about designing holistic solutions for 
areas as a whole for effectively for travel to work areas rather than simply dealing with specific parts of, for example, in Edinburgh City Centre. We need to understand that kind of holistic knock on. Um, I do think not only people have talked about complementary measures, and I think that's right. But I think working, for example, with the commercial haulage sector um, on not only their standards, but on access and egress arrangements, I think some kind of detail on the powers that we have to bring operators like that to the table needs to be included in detail in the regulation. I, I, I suspect discussions may suddenly increase. Jamie, you've got the next question. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, just to make some pragmatic points here. Um, my experience of living in London when the congestion charge was introduced is it caused huge amounts of displacement of congestion. So drivers would park on the peripheral of zones rather than in the zones or driving into the zones. Uh, small businesses would uh, use diesel vans outside of the zones instead of in the zones. Bus operators would move all their green vehicles into the zones to avoid the fines and the charges, etc. <coughs> is there a worry that, that these very localised city zones may cause problems for residents and businesses outside of them. And the other point I'd like to make is around those who aren't able to use public transport or active travel to commute in and out of cities. The reality is many people simply rely on the car as their mode of transport. Uh, <coughs> will they see this simply as just another tax on the motorist? Um, who would like to head off on that? Uh, I'll take Jim and then Gordon. Yeah, I think it emphasises the need to look at this holistically, as, as, as Paul said earlier. There will be displacement, um, and there would need to be a fair bit of work done to, um, to model and, and anticipate what that displacement would be. Uh, again, if you look at Edinburgh, for example, um, it would put more stress on the Edinburgh City Bypass, which is a route that's currently under significant stress at the moment. So, to answer the first part of your question, absolutely, uh, that needs to be predicted and, um, and addressed prior to the introduction of, of, of an LEZ. From my reading of the proposed legislation, uh, there is uh, an opportunity for certain exemptions within that for, um, for certain types of vehicles, mainly focused on emergency vehicles and you know, uh, vehicles of that, that nature. Um, and I think it's a valid point to raise in, in respect of people that have no choice but to use um, their individual transport. Uh, and I think that's something that still has to be addressed within the proposed legislation. Uh, Gordon, and then Paul. I, I'd broadly echo what Jim has just said. I'm certainly aware that in terms of the Glasgow LEZ, uh, there have been concerns from surrounding councils, uh, at least two of them, uh, in terms of the, the potential of more polluting uh, public transport vehicles, buses, uh, finding their way into these council areas, while, as you've alluded to, the greener vehicles are within the LEZ. So that is an issue that we need to be mindful of going forward. Paul. I used to work in Greater Manchester in a congestion charge. Um, ballot was lost from us precisely the reasons that you set out from um, suburban authorities um, fearing exactly the displacement issues which you um, addressed. My, my substantive point there really was, was that I think we, in designing LEZs, this is what I tried to say before, they need to be part of a kind of wider transport and placemaking solution. So yes, people will, many people will always be reliant on their car, but the way in which we design networks can help people, for example, take cars to certain places and then be able, be able to transfer easily onto other modes, park and ride, park and walk and so on. So it's thinking about the design of the network as a whole rather than purely thinking about it purely from an emissions point of view. I think in that transport design piece, we can combat a number of the issues you raise. Charlie, you wanted to come in and then I'll go back to Jamie, sorry. Um, I think Paul, Paul's covered that very well, but I'll just take a couple of points. I think um, we are, uh, and, and have had quite a number of discussions with Glasgow City Council uh, and Transport Scotland about that potential displacement. I think it'd be interesting for the committee to hear from the operators on that, um, because obviously there's a big challenge for certainly one of the big operators in Glasgow and the investment that is required in the fleet. I think one of the interesting things as a learning point that's come from the first low emissions zone in Glasgow has been that it's been felt as if it's been all on bus. 
you know, that it wasn't actually presented holistically at the beginning. I think we're over that point now, that it's understood that it's a longer-term solution. And just to echo Paul's point, the whole point about that regional assessment is so important. So, you know, the work that, you know, Scots and SPT do across authorities in terms of getting the understanding of that, that therefore means it's not just complementary measures within Glasgow City Centre about bus speeds. It may well be further investment in strategic park and ride sites and actually marketing that and making that clear that that's a really good solution for people. So your points are very, very valid. Jamie. Uh, I'd like to add very constructive answers. Thank you. Um, the, the, the problem I have, though, is that given your answers, uh, there's discussion around more modelling, around displacement, for example, more consultation with surrounding local authorities. Um, everyone's saying it needs to be part of a holistic approach to the transportation needs of a city and commuters in and out of cities. The, and that's all well and good. The problem is we have a bill before us here that we're looking at, which only introduces LEZs and nothing else. So as a committee, we're faced with the dichotomy of proceeding with the well intentions of the LEZs, but not addressing any of the other issues that you've said today. So how do we as a committee progress with the introduction of the LEZs, which I think there is wide support for, but how do we do that in a way that ensures that all of this is done before the LEZs are introduced? Uh, should there be a delay to the introduction? Should the time scale be longer? Should the grace periods be longer? You know, how, how do you think we should approach that? Charlie, um, and, and I think the, the, the grace period is, is an important point that Jamie made. So yeah, I think, Charlie, um, followed by Jim. I think we, we all did agree that that was important, and I can understand the concerns looking narrow just at that in terms of bringing that in in a bill. Certainly in the west of Scotland, the place that that then gets properly analysed is the regional transport strategy. And, for example, SPT has just commenced the, that next regional transport strategy. So over the next two years, learning both from Glasgow, but whatever comes through the bill is where that flows through into regional assessments. And, you know, it's incumbent upon us as the regional transport strategy with my kind of SPT hat on, and all those 12 authorities to come together to understand, not just LE said, but the other parts of this bill, at a practical level, how is that going to get introduced as well at a strategic level, how it's going to get assessed. So certainly from, from the west of Scotland, and I'm sure the other RTPs will echo this, that's, that's the place that we would consider it, that you strategically assess it, and that you're not left just LE said and it's kind of sitting there on its own. Jim. Just pretty much what Charlie has said. I mean, we're all... All seven RTPs are charged with providing a regional transport strategy uh, and thereafter to introduce it, um, funds, funds permitting. Um, so there is already a statutory basis um, for consideration of things such as LEZs within a regional transport strategy in, in place. And, and that's one option that you might have. Jamie, do you...? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Well, then we move on, uh, if we may, to the next questions, uh, which I believe are yours, John. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, yes, looking at parking, and I think Mike Rumbles and I are both going to be asking you questions. I think I'm focusing more on probably cars and the residential areas, and Mike Rumbles may be talking more about delivery and unloading and the commercial side of things. So, to start with, um, broadly again, do you support the principles on the prohibition of pavement parking? I, I have a constituency, and I don't think I think there'll be others like it, where we often have quite narrow roads. And the pavements are reasonably wide, and the police would say the most sensible thing is to park with two wheels on the pavement and two wheels on the road. You're not blocking the pavement, you're not blocking the road, um, and I just wonder if this bill is going to lead to lots of wide pavements being open, but lots of roads being blocked, or displacement of vehicles. So, in principle, do you agree with all of this? Is it too draconian? What do you think? Uh, so Gordon wants to come in, and Paul. Um, in principle, um, yes, we think there is a need to have tools to deal with the, the very real, real problem of pavements being obstructed. Uh, however, uh, we do have fairly significant concerns in terms of where we currently sit. Uh, we have an ongoing dialogue with Transport Scotland around the parking standards that are going to underpin uh, this legislation, and that will provide the detail uh, of when councils can exempt sections of road or sections of pavement or, or don't exempt them. Um, you are quite correct in terms of we have many um, areas of high-density housing. Uh, many of those also currently have narrow roads and narrow footpaths and already have significant parking pressures currently. 
Uh, I think there's still further work to be done to better understand how all of this is going to feed through. And while we do support the principle of having a solution to the problem, we need to be clear that the potential solutions and how it's going to feed through in terms of implementation are practical. So from a local authority point of view, first of all, we need to see what the rules are in terms of the parking standards. That, that is essential to allow us to answer the sort of questions that, that you will ask us quite reasonably. Secondly, there, there is going to be a considerable effort required to assess roads across council areas in terms of the exemption criteria. There is then considerable resource potentially required to go through some type of order process, uh, which apparently is not going to be a traffic regulation TRO type order process, but must be something similar. So that has the potential to be administratively very cumbersome. Um, and then beyond that, there is the question of signing and lining, if we're going to mark out parking bays that are part on the road and part on the carriageway. And beyond that, the question of enforcement. Uh, some councils uh, do not have decriminalised parking. Uh, some of those that do do not have evening enforcement, which will generally be the issue in residential areas. Uh, so while Scots is supportive in principle uh, of the need to have tools to deal with the, with the very real current issues, uh, we have uh, a view that there is significant further work to be done uh, to fully understand the practicalities of implementation. Jim. Um, just again to emphasise the point of looking at this holistically. Um, you know, for example, if, uh, if the, the pavement issue was addressed as part of an LEZ, uh, where you might anticipate less single occupancy cars coming into a city, um, then you might anticipate a, a means to perhaps extend the controlled parking zone and, and, and therefore reduce the number of, of cars that might be coming in and looking to park. Um, it's really just to make that point about keeping this uh, at a kind of holistic level. John. Mr. Uh, Lawrence. But Paul, Paul David, sorry. Just, yeah. just perhaps to build on um, Gordon's points, if I may, uh, which I support. Uh, I think that on the previous question we all we all said yes, but so I, I would say on this one up to a point. You know, clearly we welcome the intent, but the range of exemptions is worrying, um, and unclear and may lead to some unintended consequences. Um, the the basics of the law are you shouldn't drive on the pavement, and this appears to provide some kind of legal basis for driving on the pavement, which we don't support. Um, we think, as uh, Gordon suggested, the enforcement dimension um, seems to put the burden of proof on local authorities, which in many circumstances will find it very hard to prove and therefore uh, issue um, PCNs accordingly. And, um, Convener, I don't know if you've had a representation from Living Street Scotland, but they're certainly um, giving us uh, a pretty torrid time in terms of what they believe the implications of the exemptions to be uh, on pedestrians across the country. So I, I think the intent is good, but the devil that's in the detail is, is far from being satisfactory. David. Yes, uh, uh, similar to the others on the panel, we uh, support uh, the proposals. Um, the qualifications, again, are the resource required for enforcement. And uh, really picking up Mr Mason's uh, question, the unintended consequences that could arise um, is more typical in our area that we've got narrow roads and narrow pavements rather than narrow roads and broad pavements. That can apply in villages, it can apply in uh, suburban housing uh, schemes that were built um, not designed for present levels of car ownership. There's areas where buses uh, already have difficulty getting through the routes because of parked cars. There's a risk that that can increase. And of course, the same applies to emergency vehicles. Um, my uh, traffic uh, colleague uh, is uh, quite clear that the, the duty of um, uh, traffic uh, law is, is to, our responsibilities for the roads is to uh, keep roads clear and unobstructed. Uh, and therefore, banning pavement parking might mean having, people having to park somewhere else altogether, um, which I can see difficulties with that coming from people who can't park outside their house uh, because of um, this. 
So these are some practical consequences, but that's not to deny the benefits of uh, keeping pavements uh, clear for those who, who find um, uh, obstructed pavements uh, an obstacle for reasons that you all know. John. Um, so a couple of things, I mean, there's, there's a lot around this, so we'll try and keep it narrow, tight it down. Um, I mean, two things that have been mentioned there are there's going to be more detail coming later. So I'm interested if you folk are involved in that detail or you're being consulted on it or you're feeding into it or how that's working or if that's purely the government. And secondly, resources have been mentioned, um, which cl clearly is a problem for councils. Uh, will they be able to, will, will the penalty charges cover the costs of the enforcement? Do you think, I mean, my feeling is, and I stand to be corrected, that with double yellow lines, they are more strictly enforced in the busy city centres, town centres, high streets than they are in the outlying residential areas. Mm -hmm. um, and I, my f concern about this would also be that the, the parking will be very strictly adhered to uh, and controlled in the centres, but maybe less so in the peripheral areas, despite a blind person needing to get down the pavement and all that kind of thing. Hey, uh, Chuck Gordon. Uh, in terms of the dialogue we've had with Transport Scotland, uh, it's been good. Um, George Henry at Transport Scotland uh, runs a group that engages with all the local authorities, or at least seeks to engage with all the councils. Uh, and through that uh, group, the, the development of the parking standards has been taken forward. But as I said earlier, that still has some way to go to get to a definitive set of rules that we'd be, we'd be looking at in terms of how we're actually going to implement exemptions. Uh, in terms of costs, um, this, the view within Scots is that uh, the, the bill and the associated financial memorandum substantially underestimates the costs that are going to be involved for local authorities. Uh, and by that, I'm referring to the time required to assess roads, to process TROs or whatever order process uh, is required. Uh, to sign and line whatever exemptions are required and then to enforce. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't think that the uh, level of income from PCNs would go any significant way towards meeting these costs. Do you want to follow that up, John? Or... No, that's fine. I'm fine. Does anyone else want to come in on that? Because, Je Jamie, why don't you ask your question and then we'll go to Mike Rumble. Thanks, Gavino. It sort of carries on the theme, and I guess it's similar to the theme I had on LEZ. Do you think this is the right approach? Uh, what the government's doing is, is putting uh, a blanket ban on this. And, and there's no doubt that there is an issue that needs to be addressed. I think there's wide acceptance of that. But are we creating a, a, inadvertent consequences by having a blanket ban that then requires local authorities to apply for exemptions for uh, under national standards that, that are yet unknown, uh, it create a huge amount of work for local authorities would it be better to have a reverse scheme where councils uh, could apply for specific street bans on the roads which are problematic, uh, other, rather than the other way around, which is the approach that the government has taken, where it's the whole thing's illegal, and if you want to opt out of it, you'll need to apply to, uh, to have uh, an opt out on specific roads and streets. My worry, again, is displacement. Huge amounts of cars not being able to park at all uh, you, we cannot simply just ban parking where it is possible at the moment, uh, where are these vehicles are going to go. There, is, there often are no other parking opportunities in our suburban areas for these vehicles. Uh, I, I have absolutely no idea where all these cars are going to go, and I'm, and I'm yet to hear any evidence to, to give any suggestions as to where they might go. Bring in Jim and then Gordon, and then I'd like to move to Mike Rumbles. Jim. Just very briefly, I, I think... Either way, there's a, a huge level of bureaucracy would have to be gone through to either uh, exempt footpaths from a blanket ban or introduce footpaths that are to be, um, have to have traffic removed from them. And I suspect the, the view in taking the, the bill forward was that it's probably an easier exercise to, to go for a blanket and then remove those that are exempt from that. So it's, there's no real answer, I don't think. It just depends on these proportions as to which option would be better. Gordon. Uh, I think you, the point you make about displacement is a very valid one. Uh, and beyond displacement from a single street, there's the potential for the cumulative effect, uh, whereby uh, housing areas are often very similar in character. So if you're required to 
uh, to displace from one street, you're probably displacing out the way and you have a very significant uh, cumulative effect. Uh, I think in answer to your question, I think the devil will be in the detail here in terms of what we're allowed to exempt and how we're allowed to exempt it. So, for example, uh, could we get to a position where it's recognised that if an area has worked fine historically, that can simply be exempted? Now, if we got to that position, I think things would be a whole lot easier and it would be far more practical. But we've still got a bit to go to get to that position. Paul, you want us to come in? Just very briefly, I think your question comes back to what we're trying to achieve with these objectives of the bill. If we're trying to achieve clear footways to ensure that people with any kind of mobility issue or with a buggy or whatever it might be can go about their business just like anybody else can, it would lead to a set of regulations. If we're trying to ensure that everybody can park on the street, you know, in Edinburgh we have some extremely densely um, occupied parts of the city where, as you say, there would be a problem. But I wonder whether we're conflating policy objectives using the same instrument. Here. Okay, I'm, I'm going to move on to Mike and, and Bruce. I'm sure you'll get a chance to bring up the points in, in some of his questions. Thank you very much, Convener. This does flow, and I want to focus particularly on one of the exemptions because we're all interested in effective legislation, not ineffective legislation. And it strikes me, certainly from the written evidence that we've received in looking at the bill, in section 47, <clears throat> it says the parking prohibition, prohibit, prohibitions do not apply where a vehicle is so parked for, for, for loading, um, so parked for no longer than is necessary for the delivery, collection, loading, or unloading in any, any event for no more than a continuous period of 20 minutes. And East Dunbarnshire Council, in written evidence to us, have said that unless an enforcement officer remains at a parked vehicle for longer than 20 minutes and visualises the infringement taking place, the driver will be able to argue their case and say that they've not remained there longer than 20 minutes and that this isn't re a reasonable expectation for an enforcement officer to undertake. So the point I'm asking is, I personally think, and I'd like to hear your views of whether you think the same, I personally think that the well in, you know, it's well-intentioned putting this exemption in for businesses that want to unload or unload, but putting it there for a continuous period of 20 minutes doesn't become a maximum, it becomes the norm. And how would you possibly enforce a restriction like this, because another one, somebody else could park for 20 minutes and another person could park for 20 minutes. And so to look at Paul's point, if our whole intention is to help vulnerable path users not to, to go about the business where, where their paths aren't blocked, this is a coaching horses through this whole legislation if this is not changed. I'd like to know what you, what you think. Paul, you were nodding vigorously. Convener, I mean, in a way, I think you've probably said far more eloquently than I did in my introduction the reservations we have about the drafting of this particular part. I think the intention is good, but the exemptions are too wide-ranging and, as you say, uh, in some senses unenforceable and more work needs to be done on that detail. Would anyone else like to come in on that? Uh, Bruce? Just to emphasise, I think, the, the whole thing, really looking across the whole proposal for the bill and many aspects of this is the, the unintended consequences. Um, David uh, mentioned about the, the impact on bus services, um, not just local bus services, but also, th also things like our demand responsive transport service, my bus, which has got no set route and it goes to, uh, through communities uh, and I know there are particular areas where it is pretty much wholly reliant on people parking the pavement in order to be able to get access to someday, you know, people over 80 who are unable to use main stream public transport. Sometimes the only time when they get out of the house uh, in a week is when the my bus can come and pick them up. So just a general point. Um, again, you know, you've heard pretty much the entire panel say so we need to look at this in an integrated way and understand such impacts from a social point of view, from an equality point of view, uh, on, on the groups who, for example, use our my bus service, 500,000 passengers and counting last year. There seemed to be a general uh, nodding there. Can, uh, uh, Mike, can I bring in Peter and then come back to you? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, just uh, on this parking thing, which uh, a very important part that I think is missing in this bill is, is pre preventing parking opposite uh, dropped curbs. Dropped curbs are absolutely vital to folk, disabled people and buggies and stuff. And I think that, uh, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's anything in this bill that says parking opposite dropped curbs is, is going to be illegal. Anyone want to go on that? Yep. No. 
I mean, it, it, you seem to be agreeing. Um, mm. OK, M Mike, do you want to follow up? Your yeah, I just want to go specifically. I mean, uh, I said to the bill team last week that the drafting of this, and I asked them specifically about the 20 minutes, and it seemed to be plucked from, from the air. There doesn't seem to be any evidential basis for putting 20 minutes' res ability to, to unload. If the government came forward, or I mean, if, if they don't, I, I, I probably will intend to do is bring an amendment to remove the 20 minutes. Um, in section 47, subsection C, it says the vehicle is so parked for no longer than is necessary for the delivery, collection, loading of, or unloading. Full stop. If we remove the 20 minute allowance, if you like, would that would that help in this situation? I'd like to know what you think, Gordon. Uh, in terms of enforcement, the 20 minute uh, limit is not that much different from the type of loading restrictions we currently uh, police commonplace in town centre. So uh, the parking attendant has to observe the vehicle and has to come back 11 or 12 minutes later before they can issue a PCN. Now, that is quite clunky because it's a period of lost time. Uh, and I would agree that extending that to 20 minutes makes it even more cumbersome. Uh, however, uh, I would agree. I would accept, in principle, there is a need to provide exemptions of that type to allow people to go about their day-to-day -day business. Uh, I would suspect that leaving it open-ended would cloud matters even further, uh, because individuals may disappear into a property and argue they were going about some business associated with loading and unloading and stay for a period beyond 20 minutes. Uh, whether 20 minutes is the right figure or not, at least it's a, a kind of clear cut-off point uh, that would uh, allow the parking attendant to be entirely clear as to observing the vehicle and then issuing a PCN 21 or 22 minutes later. To ask, can I just follow that up? Because yeah. that's a very important point. At the moment, it's for you know, loading and unloading on the road, but we're talking about loading and loading on the pavement. And that's quite a significant difference because for that period of time, any one with mobility issues will probably have to be forced onto the road if they can get down there. So it is quite quite a different thing. Do you, do you accept that there is a difference between those two things? Uh, I think this is all about compromises. Uh, we're having to accommodate many different parts of society here and the, the aspirations of local businesses and, and local uh, households to go about their daily business. Uh, so, as I say, I think there are a number of compromises will be required here. And okay. it's about finding a balance. Um, John, can I... Uh, John Finney, can I bring you in on that as well? Uh, Paul, I'll bring you in. I want to try John Finney to see if it, it, it enlarges well, that. Well, indeed, it's perhaps most likely, Mr Lawrence, I was going to go to it. It, it, it is with... We're talking about, effectively, the re if it were this to pass the retrospective application with existing treats. I wanted to know if perhaps you had input to um, planning decisions to ensure that a lot of these issues are designed out. Mention was made of living streets and some of the more progressive approaches there. Hopefully any new infrastructure, setting aside maybe gap sites and town centres and city centres, this will be designed out, Mr Lawrence. Would that be the case? That would certainly be an intention, albeit um, uh, it's something that I was hoping to have the opportunity to say later, so maybe I'll sneak it in now, that it's partly dependent um, for us, um, not just on the planning process, but on the way in which um, the roads redetermination process works, which we think could be much sm smoother and is not particularly mentioned in the legislation at all. So I think that's an important um, tool in that box, as it were. Um, but I, I think, I think uh, the, the issue uh, that Mr Rumbles raises is, is, is absolutely... We're not talking about parking on the street. We're talking about on the pavement. And I, I, I've personally yet to hear a justification from a trader as to why they need to park on a pavement. Um, I, I, and it's not clear. Now, I think that, that's the nub of the issue. And the, the secondary issue is, uh, is the local flavour of it. So it might be times when we say no time is acceptable at all. So between certain hours, we say uh, it might, uh, you know, people might make it, uh, an occasion for saying we need to be able to park on the pavement for these reasons. And we say that's fine, but within those hours, that's it. So either leaving it open ended or saying 20 minutes at any time of the day is unacceptable. You know, we, we need much more local variance for that. But yes, you're right, um, particularly in, in terms of new development to designing these issue, issues out. But some of the tools we have for that are still slightly clunky. Okay, thank you. 
I, I won't ask you to, to qualify if parking on a pavement for 20 minutes and then shifting the, the lorry forward one metre constitutes reparking because that may be too difficult. But it is a question I've raised before. Stuart. Um, uh, thank you very much, Convener. Now the exciting subject of roadworks. Um, the, the Stirling Council has uh, commented on uh, the proposed repeal of Section 61 of the Road Scotland Act 1984. Uh, implying that all roadworks would be authorised under Section 109 of the New Roads and Street Works Act 1999 instead. Um, but their particular issue uh, is, uh, does that leave us with adequate uh, consultation with bus operators in particular, uh, so that they can take account of uh, roadworks in bus punctuality and reliability? Who'd like to add uh, I recognise Stirling is not necessarily represented here. Gordon, do you want to have a go at that? Um, in terms of how roads authorities would typically um, deal with something like this, we'd go through a road closure order process, uh, and that's, uh, it, it seeks to accommodate roadworks of whatever type, but we would continue to do that uh, before or after uh, any new legislation. Uh, but, but I think the point that still in council are, are, are seeking to make, I'm putting words in their mouth, so if I get it wrong, I'm wrong, um, is that there isn't therefore, a, under the new arrangements, a legal duty on them to consult with in particular bus operators, or is that a mistaken <coughs> comment by me? Uh, the, the road closure process would involve publishing a, a road closure notice, so it would be made available to the general public, the locally elected members, the bus operators, so that they would all get an, an advanced period of notice. That's fine, and I think that helpfully closes that one down, uh, subject to any further information. Um, the, 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 the other one, uh, there are duties created by the bill about signage, fencing and lighting uh, for uh, site supervisors and operators uh, and qualifications of them. Are you content with what the bill says on that subject? Yeah, we uh, we did a kind of small survey of our well, a survey of all our 32 councils, uh, and we got a response of about two thirds of them, uh, and only two of these councils were not do, not yet doing what is currently required of the bill, and both of these councils recognised the need to move in that direction, and indeed were already doing so. David would like to come. All right. Yes, thank you. I'd like to just come back on Mr. Stevenson's first question, the one from Stirling, and certainly and it's an issue with us, and I know from colleagues in the Association of Transport Coordinating Officers that's an issue around the country, is um, liaison between bus operations and, and road works. Now, a lot of the time, certainly through our council, it works fairly well, but there are some utilities who can uh, push the boundaries, let's say, uh, and I would, I would certainly welcome uh, a statutory requirement to consult with bus operators. I think it would be very helpful. Just to be clear, when the boundaries are pushed, that is not in contravention with the statutory position. It's merely an unhelpful practice. Is that what we're being told? Um, I'm being diplomatic with my word. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. th th there may be time to be yes. undiplomatic if I, you want change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know that the Roadworks Commissioner has had concerns about uh, lack of notice being provided or, or works being de claimed to be emergency when they're not genuinely emergency works. Um, and... Uh, these kind of issues. So, enfor stronger enforcement uh, powers which are in the bill for the Roadworks Commissioner, I, I think, very welcome. It might be convenient, uh, useful, perhaps, if we... Uh, I know that we're asking questions about the Roadworks Commissioner, we may want to ask that person. Um, yes, just, just before we do, can I just ask a question? Uh, you, there was an indication there that on road closure orders there ought to be consult consultation with... with bus companies and other road users. Do you believe that the current system allows all businesses that are going to be affected by those road closures uh, to, be, to feed in before the order is published? And just so there's no debate, I am part of a farming business which sometimes is affected by road closures. So if anyone would like to uh, make a comment, but as a general comment, do you think all businesses are given enough chance to consult before roads are closed? Gordon. 
Uh, I think you have to be very careful about the expectation which uh, the consultation process would raise. Uh, it, it really depends on the nature of the works being undertaken and whether they can be carried out safely with a road still open. Now, frequently, it will not be possible to keep a road open and, and do certain works. Now, I would be cautious about going through a consultation process in that scenario, because that, that would lead to the expectation that the road closure might potentially be avoidable. Uh, the obligations on roads authorities when managing roadworks and dealing, dealing with the individual utilities is to satisfy themselves as far as they reasonably can that the works will be undertaken in such a way as to minimise disruption to the travelling public. Now, there is a kind of inherent weakness, and it maybe goes back to what David alluded to there. Occasionally, you will be left with the impression that works are taken taking longer than they might with a particular utility. However, frequently they will come back with some sort of quite plausible technical explanation as to why they have to do this or that, and um, works don't appear to be progressing quite as quickly as the public and roads authorities might like. Uh, however, with these sort of matters, we're really often in the hands of the, the technical experts within uh, the electricity companies or the gas companies, the people that know their own networks best. OK. Perfect point to bring in Maureen. Yeah, just before I come to my main question, um, obviously previous legislation gave councils the uh, uh, ability to appoint a person who could coordinate utilities <coughs> digging up the road so that if the gas were in and the water needed to do work in the same street that it was done at the same time. Has that worked? Has, have you seen a reduction in the number of times specific roads have been dug up? Or, you know, have you managed to get that cooperation between the utilities? And now, increasingly, fibre optic laying companies. Gordon, do you want to try that? Um, it probably doesn't work as well as we would like. Uh, the number of times utilities will, will go in and share the, the same uh, opening trench is limited. Uh, there might be good reasons for that. The electricity, uh, the power companies will not want to lay cables beside gas mains for very good reasons. Uh, it's certainly a source of frustration to uh, the travelling public, often the, the amount of roadworks in a particular area. Uh, However, um, I think we need to be clear that roads are not just for getting people from A to B. They're very important conduits for critical public infrastructure. Uh, and these power companies and gas companies and the, the like need to be given reasonable opportunity to access uh, their, their plan to do whatever is necessary. Uh, it's the job of the Roads Authority to seek as far as possible to uh, ensure that that's done in a way that... Uh, mitigates inconvenience to the travelling public, so typically will require that works are done off-peak or are done on Sundays. Who wants to come in? I welcome what the Bill um, is suggesting. Uh, I think there may be practice, which may be outside legislation or in guidance, where we encourage utilities to improve their general communications to because to your question, convener, you know, have there been occasions in this city where uh, utility providers have not uh, communicated effectively with businesses and residents? The answer to that question is yes. Now, I'm not sure that I think, I think the, the bill takes us in the right direction, but it's really much more about day-to-day -day work with their officials, with elected members, with community councils and so on, and establishing relationships that work effectively, which I'm not sure you can entirely do through legislation. You're absolutely right about fibre providers. We have them effectively competing with each other um, in Edinburgh at the moment, and we try to play as Roads Authority in the way that Gordon sets out a coordinating role in that. I think at times that could be strengthened and the bill is helpful in that regard, but it's as much about good practice as about the legislative context. So the, roads, the Scottish Road Works Commissioner will gain new inspection uh, and enforcement powers, um, some of which will be applicable to local authorities. Do you support the introduction of these proposals? Paul? We, we do. Uh, Gordon? Yes, it does. Thank you. Seeing anyone who's putting their hand up to say they disagree, say, uh, uh, 
I'm assuming that's a positive one. Are you happy with that? And we'll move on to the next question. Next question is from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. It's a small but important section at the end of the bill about regional transport partnership finance. Now, the bill um, proposes three changes to the current uh, governance of the finance. It will require constituent councils to fund the balance uh, of the RTP's estimated costs rather than the actual costs. It will amend the Local Government Scotland Act 1975 to allow RTPs to hold and operate capital funds, renewal and repair funds and insurance funds in a similar way to councils do. And it will extend provisions in the Local Government Scotland Act 1994 to cover RTPs. And this would grant RTPs the power to borrow and lend money and to also operate a loan fund. Do you support these proposals and do they go far enough? Who'd like to... Oh, all the hands up. Bruce, followed by Charlie. <laughs> yes, I support them very, very much. I think it's something that um, we've been lobbying the, the, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Executive previously for some time, really since RTPs were established, that we believed this was some form of blip in the, in the legislative process that allow us to take a much longer and holistic view uh, of the of the transport network and how we plan to deliver for that and just open up that flexibility and put us on a, an equal footing with councils who I think again will also benefit from us being able to do that uh, so very much supportive of these okay Charlie yeah, just take that point um, we've lobbied very hard for this um, this has very uh, put us in the difficult position year after year where we have many, many projects, uh, certainly in the SPT area, and we've had a huge workaround to this problem, shall we say, my fi finance colleagues tell me. So the ability to have this flexibility, and even in some of the stuff we're already doing, will be hugely beneficial. Okay. Does anyone else want to add anything to that? Okay, if you're happy with that, we'll, we'll move on to the final question, which comes from Mike Rumbles. Convenient. And I just wanted a brief question on canals. Um, not always at the top of the agenda with transport, but I'm very well aware of how important they are to local communities. Uh, in Edinburgh, you know, the Union Canal, the canal festivals. Communities have got their own. I mean, I just give one example. Polworth Church in Edinburgh has got its own community um, landings through the Waterways Board, and it's great. And then all of a sudden, the canals are shut. Um, and this bill just mentions a requirement to change the board members. Would this not be an opportunity to put in legislation, a reinforcement, that they should, the board should have a duty to keep the canals open and navigable? Um, what do you think of that? Who'd like to answer that? Um, well, somebody's got to come in. You're I, all looking the other way. Well, Paul, it, it, thank you. I have to say, it's not an area I, I was kind of prepared to talk about, but I think the answer, based on our experience with exactly the area you talk about, is yes, and we do sometimes have that issue of coordination, so I think that would be welcome. Mm -hmm. anyway, uh, Gordon. I, I think you can draw a parallel with uh, authorities having a statutory duty to maintain road networks. Uh, if you have responsibility for maintaining a canal network, it doesn't seem unreasonable that that is reflected in statute. Thank you. Okay. thank you. I think that brings us uh, to the end of our questions. So I'd like to thank you all for coming along. And I'm now going to briefly suspend the meeting to allow you to depart. And I'd ask members to stay in their seats, please.
Okay, we now move back into a uh, formal session. This is the agenda item three, which is UK statutory instruments, environment, food and rural affairs and sea fishing enforcement. This is consideration of letters from the Scottish Government concerning two UK statutory instruments. The Scottish Government has written advising the committee that it has given its permission to allow the UK Government to make these instruments on its behalf. Does the committee agree to note this correspondence or does anyone wish to make a comment? Stuart, you wish to make a comment. Um, I'm content to note both these items of correspondence. I, I just, however, in relation to the sea fishing enforcement regulations, uh, make the point that in essence, uh, what it is about is allowing con a, a continuity of the south of the border officers to come in in hot pursuit into Scottish waters. Very much support that. Um, I just don't see any corresponding arrangements or even know if they're necessary for Scottish officers to, to go to the south. Uh, I, I read at the bottom of uh, what is page six in our uh, papers, um, provisions within these regs close a potential enforcement gap in the management UK and shore fisheries sector and could indirectly provide an aid to preventing circumvention, circumvention of Scottish regulations. I suggest we might possibly write to the Minister and ask what that means. That's all. Okay. I, I think that's a fair point. So um, I suggest that the committee notes these comment, comments and asks the clerks to correspond with the Scottish Government officials to ascertain the position. But in the meantime, having noted those comments, is the committee just happy to note these two instruments, uh, uh, the, this correspondence that goes through? Agreed. Okay, that is agreed, and that therefore concludes today's committee business, and I now close the meeting.